Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we are going to continue looking at plate tectonics. So this presentation is going to correspond to section 3.6 of your textbook. So we're going to start looking at convergent plate boundaries. So a convergent plate boundary forms when we have two pieces of crust banging into each other, so they crash into one another. Now, because there are two different types of crust, it actually means there are three different types of convergent plate boundary. So the first type of convergent plate boundary is what's referred to as an ocean-ocean convergent plate boundary. And that's when a piece of oceanic crust hits another piece of oceanic crust. Now, the second type of convergent plate boundary is called an ocean-continent convergent plate boundary. That's when a piece of oceanic crust meets a piece of continental crust. And then the final type is the continent-continent convergent plate boundary, and that's when a piece of continental crust collides with another piece of continental crust. So we're going to work our way through these three different types of convergent plate boundary, and we're going to discuss the processes that are taking place. So we're going to start with the ocean-ocean convergent plate boundary. So in this situation, we have, a, an, uh, we have a situation where we have two pieces of oceanic crust colliding with one another. So we can see that this piece of oceanic crust here is moving to the right, this piece of oceanic crust here is moving to the left, and of course a collision is therefore inevitable. They're going to crash head into, headlong into each other. So what are some of the things that we see taking place when this happens? Well, the first thing is, is we can see that this piece of oceanic crust on the left is being pushed down into the Earth's mantle. Now, this is a process called subduction, and it's very important that you understand what this process is, because it is going to turn up a lot in geology. So, this process of taking this piece of oceanic crust, pushing it under another piece of crust, and forcing it down into the mantle is called subduction, and it's very, very important. Now, you're thinking to yourself, well, hold on a minute. This piece of oceanic crust here is exactly the same as this piece of oceanic crust here. So why does this piece get pushed down into the mantle? And that's a perfectly reasonable question. The answer is, is that in most cases, the piece of oceanic crust that's being pushed down into the mantle is not attached to anything. This piece of oceanic crust here is actually probably attached to a piece of continental crust. We know that continental crust is less dense and therefore it's naturally more buoyant. It will float more efficiently. And if this piece of oceanic crust is attached to a piece of continental crust, it too will have a bit of a, an added buoyancy from the continental crust. And so it will mean that this piece of oceanic crust here will be less likely to be subducted. So it means that this piece of oceanic crust here, which is not connected to anything like a piece of continental crust, is more likely to be subducted because it is less buoyant. And so we have this piece of oceanic crust is being pushed down into the mantle where it is being subducted. Now, in terms of surface features associated with convergent plate boundaries, we have, uh, sorry, with ocean-ocean convergent plate boundaries, we have two main features. We have the formation of a trench, and we have the formation of a volcanic island arc. Remember, that's a line of volcanic islands that have a curved shape to them. So let's look through some of the key features associated with ocean-ocean convergent boundaries. So number one, we have the trench, and you'll notice the trench is forming where the piece of oceanic crust is beginning to subduct under the other piece. So the trench actually marks the location where subduction is beginning, where our piece of oceanic crust is beginning to be pushed down into the Earth's mantle. So that's what's causing the trench to form. Next, we have something which is referred to as the accretionary prism. And the accretionary prism is essentially a mess. It's a mass of different types of rock all jumbled together. So you have to remember that this piece of oceanic crust here is going to have a layer of sediment on top of it. And as this piece of oceanic crust gets pushed down into the mantle, the layer of sediment on the top of it gets scraped off. At the same time, bits of the oceanic crust will also break off, and we will also have rocks being contributed by volcanic eruptions from the islands as well. So what we have here is we have a situation where we have a region called the accretionary prism, which is a mixture of sediments that get scraped off the subducting oceanic crust, 
bits of oceanic crust that break off the subducting oceanic crust, and volcanic rocks that form due to eruptions on the volcanic islands. And they all get mixed together in this very chaotic area, which we refer to as the accretionary prism. And as you can see, it has this rather distinctive triangular shape to it. Now, as our piece of oceanic crust goes down into the mantle, something quite interesting happens. Now, our piece of oceanic crust is obviously going to be full of water. Now, you think of water in the case of the liquid. Now, yes, there are going to be lots and lots of cracks in this piece of oceanic crust, and they're going to contain water. But as, they, as the oceanic crust subducts down into the mantle, the water in those cracks is going to start to be lost. It's going to heat up. It's going to start to circulate away. So we're going to lose that water. But down here, at around 150 kilometers down, something quite interesting happens. At about 150 kilometers, the minerals that make up the oceanic crust go through a process called dewatering. Okay, so there are lots of minerals in this oceanic crust that contain water as part of their chemical formula. Around 150 kilometers down, those minerals that contain water become naturally unstable. They don't like the conditions anymore. The temperature's too high, the pressure's too high, and so they can't exist in those conditions, and so they have to turn into a new mineral. And it just so happens that when they turn into new minerals, they will typically turn into minerals that do not contain water. And so this means that what happens is, is you end up with this uh, metamorphism, this reaction taking place, which is taking a water-bearing mineral and turning it into a water-free mineral. So you have to wonder to yourself, well, what happens to the water that gets released? Well, it just so happens that the water that gets released obviously goes up and it enters the mantle. And the problem is, is the mantle does not like water at all. And so the addition of the water into the mantle makes it unstable. So the water acts as something called a flux. And the flux encourages the mantle rocks to melt. So by adding the water, we're driving down the melting point of the mantle rocks. And so the mantle rocks begin to melt. And obviously when the mantle rocks melt, they start creating magma. And that magma will then start rising. And the magma will then rise through the crust and the mantle. And some of it will make it onto the Earth's surface where it will be erupted through volcanoes. And it will start forming volcanic islands. So this is the process that ends up producing the magma that feeds the volcanic islands at the surface. So our next boundary is going to be the ocean continent convergent boundary. And straight away, I'm sure you'll notice that it bears a lot of similarities to the ocean ocean convergent boundary. So in the case of an ocean continent convergent boundary, we have a piece of oceanic crust meeting a piece of continental crust. Now we know that continental crust is naturally very, very buoyant. It will not sink easily. In contrast, the oceanic crust is rather dense, so it will actually sink, comparatively speaking, quite easily when compared to continental crust. And so when we have a piece of oceanic crust meeting a piece of continental crust, it's always going to be the piece of oceanic crust that gets subducted. It's that simple. It's pretty much unavoidable. Now, you'll notice that we have several features which we saw um, in the uh, continent, con sorry, in the ocean ocean convergent boundary. So, obviously, we have our trench here, we have our accretionary prism here, and we have our subducting piece of oceanic crust there. So, just like the, um, the ocean ocean convergent boundary, our piece of oceanic crust is going to be subducted down into the mantle. And at about 150 kilometers down, it's going to dewater. So, we're going to lose water from the piece of oceanic crust. That water is going to enter the mantle. It's going to make the mantle unstable. And so, the mantle is going to start melting. Now, the resulting magma is then going to rise through the mantle rise through the continental crust and it's obviously going to feed volcanoes on the surface which are part of the mountain range. Now one of the things to remember is that the vast majority of the magma that's making its way through the crust will never make its way to the surface. It will get trapped en route and so that means these mountain belts are going to be absolutely stuffed 
with intrusive igneous rocks. So these are igneous rocks that form when magma gets stuck in the crust and cools down slowly underground. So what we find is we find these mountain ranges are full of uh, intrusive igneous rocks, of which a classic example would be something like granite. Now, this means that ocean continent convergent plate boundaries have several features. The first feature is that the uh, continental crust will obviously have a mountain range or a mountain belt, as it's sometimes called. And this is simply like a crumple zone when two cars crash into each other. So when the two cars crash into each other, the crumple zone essentially is deformed by the force of the impact. The same thing is happening right here. Our piece of uh, continental crust is interacting with our piece of oceanic crust, and that interaction is causing the continental crust to buckle. Now, this buckling also has another effect. Because it's causing the crust to fold, it means the crust is getting thicker. And so if we look right here, you'll notice that this is our original continental crust thickness. You'll notice our mountain range in contrast is considerably thicker. And that's because the crust is being deformed. And so it's causing the crust to thicken up. At the same time, we have additional mass being added to our mountain range in the form of these intrusive igneous rocks that form due to magma cooling down under the surface. Now, at the surface of the Earth, we will also have volcanoes, and they will be the result of some of the magma making its way to the surface where it will be erupted. And we will obviously have lots and lots of earthquakes due to the deformation. And so ocean continent convergent plate boundaries are, geologically speaking, a very, very active environment. So now we've looked at the first two types of convergent plate boundary, let's just take a second to have a look at the Pacific. So what we notice when we look at the Pacific is that there is a chain of volcanoes that pretty much goes around the entire margin of the Pacific Ocean Basin. This is referred to as the Ring of Fire. Now, you'll notice that all the way along the edge of the Pacific here, we can see we have trenches. So we can see the trench here along the western side of South America. We can see the trench here along the western side of Central America. And we know there's a trench up here in the Cascade region. We can see there's a trench here associated with the Aleutian Islands, trench here associated with the chain of islands which are part of the uh, Japanese chain. We have a trench here associated where we have two pieces of oceanic crust meeting, the Philippines plate here and the Pacific plate here. We have a trench here associated with this oceanic crust meeting this piece of continental crust of the Eurasian plate here. And we have a trench forming where we have the Pacific uh, oceanic crust of the Pacific plate here meeting the oceanic crust of the Indo-Australian plate here. So the fact that we can see these trenches all over the place clearly tell us that these are convergent plate boundaries. But we'll notice there's two different types in this scenario. We have the type that we have on the western side of South America, which is going to be an ocean continent convergent boundary. And then we have the types which we have over here, for instance, like the Aleutian Trench, which is where we have an ocean ocean convergent plate boundary. And you'll notice there are differences in the, in the uh, morphology of what's being formed, as we've already discussed. So along the eastern side of um, the Ring of Fire, where we have the oceanic crust subducting underneath the continental crust, we obviously have the formation of an extensive mountain chain that extends all the way from southern South America all the way up to Alaska. And we can see that this mountain chain is volcanically active, and it's also going to be very, very active with earthquakes. Now, once we leave Alaska and we start moving across the Bering Strait or across the Bering Sea between um, Alaska and Russia, what do we see? Well, we see there's a change in the situation. We see we transition from this mountainous terrain, inc uh, which includes volcanoes, to a chain of volcanic islands, which has a very distinctive curved morphology, curved shape to the chain of islands. And so, as we know, this curved chain of volcanic islands is called an island arc. And we know that these are associated with ocean-ocean convergent plate boundaries. So we know that once we've essentially left here, once we've left Alaska and we're moving across the Bering Sea, we are essentially beginning to move into an ocean-ocean convergent regime.
Now, this picture here actually illustrates quite nicely why some oceanic crust will subduct and other oceanic crust will not. So if we look, we can see we have the Pacific plate right here. And you'll notice the Pacific plate isn't attached to anything. OK, it's just a standard but very large piece of oceanic crust. In contrast, we have another piece of oceanic crust right here. But this piece of oceanic crust is attached to a big piece of continental crust. And remember that continental crust is going to act as a buoyancy aid. It's going to help to make this piece of oceanic crust here more buoyant so it's less likely to subduct. So when the Pacific plate here meets this piece of oceanic crust up here, it's going to be the Pacific plate that subducts down into the mantle. So if we look over here along the um, east, uh, western side sorry, of the Ring of Fire, we can see we have essentially a string of ocean-ocean convergent plate boundaries coming all the way down. We have some coming down around here. We have some coming down around here. And then we have a set over here associated with Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Tonga, and eventually down here to the North Island of New Zealand. And so you will see that these islands or these uh, terrains, although mountainous, the reason they're mountainous is not to do with the crust really being deformed, which is the process that happens over here where we have the formation of a mountain range. The elevated terrain is due to the sheer number of volcanoes. So it's all the volcanoes which you know end up forming mountains, giving us the elevated terrain in these ocean-ocean convergent plate boundaries. In contrast, at the ocean-continent convergent plate boundaries, a lot of the elevated terrain, the mountain range, is produced by the continental crust buckling and deforming as part of the collision. So you'll notice there's also this distinct difference between the uh, type of morphology, the, the, the way the land looks when compared between a ocean continent and ocean ocean convergent plate boundary. So if we look here is a, essentially a cross section through the Pacific Ocean, we can see here is our spreading ridge. So this is where the new crust is being made. This is a divergent plate boundary and this is called the Pacific Rise. So this piece of oceanic crust here is the Pacific Plate and this piece of oceanic crust here is what's called the Nazcar Plate. And this is South America over here and this is going to be the Western Pacific over here. So what can we see happening? Well, obviously we have our oceanic crust being pushed away from the rift. So one piece is going this way and one piece is going this way. So the Nazca plate is being pushed eastwards and it's meeting the westward moving um, South American plate. And obviously we have oceanic crust meeting continental crust. It's always going to be the oceanic crust that loses. The oceanic crust gets pushed down into the mantle and it begins to subduct. In contrast, over here, we have the Pacific plate being pushed westwards and eventually it meets the oceanic crust of the West Pacific. However, as we've already discussed, the oceanic crust over here is typically attached to pieces of buoyant continental crust. And so that means it is less likely to subduct. And so when our piece of Pacific uh, plate meets our piece of slightly more buoyant uh, oceanic crust over here, it's going to be the Pacific plate that gets pushed down into the mantle and subducts. Now, in terms of the differences in morphology, as we've discussed, we have an ocean continent divergent uh, convergent boundary over here. So there's our trench. But we can see in this case, the collision is causing the continental crust to buckle and deform, producing the mountain range. And we know that our mountain range is going to be full of volcanoes and it's also going to be very earthquake rich as well. In terms of the ocean ocean boundary over here, same process. Oceanic crust gets subducted, it melts, but it ends up forming volcanic islands. And eventually, if the volcanic islands get large enough, they will start to join together to form larger land masses. A good example of that would be Japan. Now, we know that these volcanic islands and the uh, volcanic terrains like Japan of the Western Pacific are also mountainous, just like the Andes, for instance. But we know that the, you know, the, the elevated terrain in those areas is not the result of the crust being deformed. It's simply the result of the growth of the volcanoes in that area. So there's so many volcanoes that it ends up producing mountainous terrain because the volcanoes get so large.
So our final type of convergent boundary is going to be the continent-continent convergent boundary. So in the case of a continent-continent convergent plate boundary, we have a piece of oceanic crust which is being subducted underneath a piece of continental crust. So we have a ocean-continent convergent boundary right here. The thing is, is that attached to this piece of con uh, oceanic crust is a piece of continental crust. So as the piece of oceanic crust starts moving along and subducting down underneath this piece of continental crust here, it is dragging this piece of continental crust along with it. So as this oceanic crust here gets destroyed, this piece of continental crust moves ever closer to this piece of continental crust. And eventually there is going to be a collision. So obviously we have the establishment of a um, ocean continent convergent plate boundary here. We form an accretionary prism. We have lots of volcanic activity going on due to the oceanic crust melting down here at about 150 kilometers depth. But you'll notice the size of the body of water between these two pieces of continental crust is getting smaller as more and more of the oceanic crust gets destroyed. Eventually, the entire piece of oceanic crust will um, be destroyed, so it will be subducted, it will be gone, and at that point, our two pieces of continental crust are going to run headlong into each other. There's going to be a collision. Now, the problem is, is that continental crust, by its very nature, is buoyant and it will not subduct. So when the two pieces of crust meet each other, neither of them is going to subduct, and so they're just going to crash head on into each other and this is going to lead to a lot of deformation and crustal thickening and the crustal thickening is going to uh, well crustal thickening when combined with deformation is going to lead to the formation of some very large mountain ranges a classic example would be the himalayas where india is crashing into asia so you'll notice as part of the collision, typically what will happen is we'll form what's called a collision zone, which is a region where the crust gets very badly faulted. And you'll notice we have these big sheets of rock forming and some of them are getting pushed one on over the top of another. And it's the stacking of these sheets of rock one on top of another that helps to start to make the crust thicker. And that thickening of the crust essentially makes the crust stand higher because remember, the thicker the crust, the higher the elevation. And so as we begin to thicken the crust, it creates a natural topographic high, which is our mountain range. At the same time, you'll notice that at the top of our mountain range here, the conditions are actually relatively flat. This is our, this is our plateau. This is like the Tibetan plateau. So obviously we have a set of mountains, which would be the Himalayas, and then we have our plateau behind it. That would represent the Tibetan plateau. So here's a blow up of the diagram we were just talking about. So here's one piece of continental crust, here's the other piece of continental crust, and here is our collision zone. And you can see we have these big faults and it's pushing one sheet of rock over the top of another sheet of rock. So it's stacking them one on top of another, thereby making the crust thicker. So these pieces of, of crust get sliced off during in the collision zone, and as I said, they stack one on top of another, increasing crustal thickness. Now, of course, we know the continental crust is buoyant, so it, this piece will not subduct at all. That piece will not subduct, so subduction has to stop when they collide with each other. Now, because there's no subduction anymore, this means oceanic crust is no longer going down into the mantle. If there's no oceanic crust, then there's no oceanic crust to dewater at 150 kilometers down. If there's no dewatering, then that means there's no water going into the mantle. Remember, in order to melt the mantle, we need to add the water to it. So if we're not adding water, the mantle won't melt. And because the mantle isn't melting anymore, that means there's no more magma. And that means if there's no more magma, of course, that means there's nothing to feed volcanoes on the surface. So that is why the continent-continent mountain ranges, like the Himalayas, although being very big, there being loads of deformation, lots and lots of earthquakes, they are very volcano poor because there's no magma being generated down here to feed the volcanoes at the surface. And if there's no magma, then the volcanoes simply can't exist. So once again, you'll notice that the crust becomes noticeably thicker at the point of the collision because we have these sheets of rock being pushed one on top of another. 
as we've also discussed, the thicker the crust, the higher it stands. And so as this crust becomes thicker, it causes the ground to rise up and produce a topographic high, which we see as a mountain range. Okay, that's it everybody. Thank you for watching and have a good day.